everyone, and welcome back to the Museum Show and Tell Show. I'm your host, Nicole, and I'm here with Jan Hi. and Genevieve from the Hello. Royal Museum and Jan from the Penitentiary Museum. So today in this week's um, episode, um, Genevieve from Horoni Museum challenged us to find um, a book, an artifact that is a book. And so we're just very eager to find out what you have for us today. <laughs> Okay. All right. So I have brought this in. It is the owl pen. And for mm -hmm. anyone who is not familiar with that book, um, it was one of, I guess, of a series of books that was, this one was published in 1947, although this is a reprint, but the original was published in 1947. And um, it was based, I guess, on a, let me step back a bit. In the 1930s, the late 1930s, there was a journalist who worked for the Toronto Telegram. His name was Kenneth McNeil Wells, and he was married to a lovely woman by the name of Lucille Oil, who was a, an artist. She was actually a sculptor. Um, they decided to leave behind their lives in Toronto and... Um, become farmers, I guess. So they eventually, after driving around uh, and looking for, you know, possible places to live, they, they, they uh, ended up in Medanti where they purchased a sort of run down, I guess, broken down uh, farmhouse. They dismantled it and rebuilt it on a, a small property that they bought from a, a farmer in Medante and they uh, called their farm the Owl Pen. And so this is based on a series of articles that Ken wrote for the Toronto Telegram. Um, and Lucille, although she trained as a sculptor, she decided to, she was, I guess, commissioned to create a series of uh, wood block carving prints for the book and I'll show you a few of them they're absolutely delightful and you can re they really um catch the tone I guess of the book the book is very sort of tongue-in-cheek and it makes fun very self-deprecating it really makes fun of this sort of fish out of water experience that the two had when they decided to move up here. Uh, they had absolutely no experience in farming. Everything they learned, they read from uh, books and manuals. And they actually opened, uh, uh, sold a lot of their uh, honey. They had a massive um, collection of uh, beehives and they sold honey. Uh, I know there are a lot of uh, their honey pots around and we actually have, uh, I should have brought it over, but we do have for sale in our, um, our shop at the museum, a few of the plaques that were based on those, um, the labels on the, on the honey jars. So there's the reconstructed farmhouse. Uh, this one is something that will be familiar, a lot of you will be familiar with. There's, they are making maple sugar in the bush. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, here we are, there they are checking the beehives, oh, the beehives yeah, um, uh, here is, they didn't keep cows, but they did have goats, and there's Lucille, she's milking one of the goats <laughs> in the barn, mm -hmm. and this is one of my favorite scenes. It's not a very glamorous scene and it doesn't really have much to do with farming life, but I drive about half an hour between um, work and my house in Phelpston every day. And this is the kind of thing that makes me very nostalgic for my childhood. I did grow up in the country and it's just a little brooklet or a stream that runs through a farmer's field. And it's got these undulating uh, banks and there's nothing growing there. It's just really, really peaceful. And I know we used to sit down uh, on banks like that when I was a kid and, and look for owls. Um, and anyway, it's just a wonderful series of books. He also, let's see, I've got the list of the others somewhere around here. Um, oh, The Owl Pen, that was published in 1947. We've got Moonstone Creek up Madante Way uh, by Jumping Cat Bridge um, was the last one about the farm. 
1967, they sold the farm, moved down to Virginia so they could sail their boat on the Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually did come back to Canada. Um, and they also wrote a book that has nothing to do with farming. If you're not interested in farming, you might also try. Uh, they did try, um, write a book about uh, cruising on the Trent Severn Waterway. So that's also a local topical book. So they're uh, just easy, fun read, really delightful. So, yeah, I'd encourage you all to go to the library and check them out. Oh, nice. I hadn't heard of that. Um, Lucille, has she, she's passed away? She did, yeah. Yeah, I'm not entirely yeah. sure when. I know that she did end up back in um, uh, Aurelia. She did move back after okay. Kenny died. She moved back into to Aurelia. And she was there for, I think, until her death. But I'm not entirely sure when she died unfortunately and we oh, do okay. have a lot of the the printing blocks from her her uh her, the various books that she illustrated outside of her own husband's oh. book she did illustrate other books as well and we have a lot of the printing blocks and i know when we had an exhibit that came out we um use those printing blocks to create oh. prints and we do still have a few of them um for sale so anyone who likes pussy cats there is a really nice oh. uh kitty print for sale oh, <laughs> so, the eye. yeah they're wonderful they're really lots of fun and serious art as well oh. very right. nice that's neat now could you could you get those books in our local library or i would imagine they are i know uh this was reprinted um not so long ago but i've seen them for sale on abe books um and ebay as well and uh, occasionally I've seen them at secondhand stores, like, you know, thrift stores, they'll, they'll pop up for sale or garage sales. So hey. yeah, keep an eye out. Yes, I will. All right. So um, our book for today is also, we do not have a first edition of that book either. Uh, but what I have here <laughs> is called Winter Studies and Some Summer Rambles in Canada and it says volume two on it and it's by Anna Jameson and if you look inside so this is a reprint but it was originally written in 1838 so it is a first person account of uh the the Canada in particular um Ontario what is now known as Ontario and uh Anna Jameson she was an Anglo-Irish um, art historian and author and feminist and she was had an expertise in um, German culture and Shakespeare and uh, she married Robert Simpson Jameson in 1825 um, in England and then their marriage did not go so well I guess they got married and after a few years he left for the Dominican and then he eventually came to Canada and he summoned for her to come to Canada in 1836 because he wanted um, to advance in his political career. He wanted the role of vice chancellor of Upper Canada and so he wanted her to come um, so that he could help with the promotion and she wanted to come basically to um, officially uh, in a way separate after after her duty <laughs> Of helping him getting the promotion she was hoping they could officially separate. So she came in 1836 and um, was here for about, you know, 18 months and traveled um, all the way up to Detroit and wrote about those accounts. And then when she went back to England, she published the book. And so there's, um, we have a copy in our research room upstairs and I'm sure we found it on online. So I'm sure on Amazon, you could find it and for any online bookstores or used bookstores, um, maybe even the local library. I'm not sure, I haven't checked to see if they have it, but she does, it is interesting to hear a female perspective, especially in the 1830s of what the area around here was. And she did uh, visit Penn and Tang Machine and she did um, talk to a lot of the, the locals here. And so I do have a couple of, of excerpts. Her first one is like, she went on, uh, you know, the voyage. She started in Detroit and came down to Penn and Tang Machine and then over to Aurelia. And um, she describes her, the, the crew, there were two canoes, each five and 20 feet in length and four feet in width. 
And um, Mr. Jar on the first canoe were Mr. Jarvis and myself, the governor's son, a lively boy of 14 or 15 years old, old Solomon, and uh, Solomon would have been Louis Solomon, who was actually Voyager from Panukanguishin, um, the interpreter. So that was Solomon the interpreter, and seven Voyagers. My, my blankets and night gear being rolled up in a bundle served for a seat and I had a pillow at my back and thus I reclined at the bottom of the canoe as, as in a litter very much at my ease. My companions were almost equally comfortable. And then she said, I had near me my cloak, umbrella and parasol, my notebooks and a sketchbooks and a little compact basket, always by my side containing eau de cologne. So imagine this. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> have her cologne with her when she's on this voyage and all those necess necessary luxuries which might be wanted in a moment for I was well resolved that I would occasion the trouble but was in inevitable. The voyagers were disposed on low wooden seats suspended to the ribs of the canoe except our Indian steersman Martin who in a cotton shirt arms bare to the shoulder, loose trousers, a scarlet sash round his waist, richly embroidered with beads and his long black hair waving, took his place in the stern with a paddle twice as long as the others. So she's very descriptive of everyone that she comes in contact, which is really, you know, wonderful to give us some historical context um, of what they were. Here's another little excerpt. Um, next morning, we were off by five o'clock. My beautiful lake looked horribly sulky and all the little islands were lost in a cold gray vapor. We were now in the Georgian Bay. Through the misty atmosphere loomed a distant shore of considerable height. Dupre told me what I saw was the Ile de Christian, which would have been Christian Island, and that formerly there was a large sediment of the Jesuits there, and that still there were to be seen the remains of a grand cathedral. About nine o'clock, we entered the Bay of Penetangshin, so called from a high sand bank at the entrance, which is continually crumbling away. The expressive Indian name signifies, look, it is falling sand, which I <laughs> think hilarious because now we say Penetangshin means land of the white rolling fans. Yeah. <laughs> 1836, when she got the interpretation, look, it's falling sand, <laughs> which is probably, you know, a little bit more of what it was, but it's, um, there's also just so much other great, you know, descriptive, um, you know, moments in, in this book, and, and it's a really uh, interesting sort of account, firsthand account, of you know the 1830s, and it talks about you know Penetang machine and the commuted pensioners. It talks about the treatment of some of the um, indigenous community here. Um, she was quite sympathetic because because as a feminist writer, she wanted to compare her own station in life as a female to those of the indigenous, especially the female indigenous um, um, at that time. So there's a lot of written accounts of that. Um, so this is what she looked like in about 1844. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so we really, um, you know, it's kind of a really great, you know, sort of history of this area. And I do recommend anybody to, to pick it up and, and read it. So that is our book. Our, our I'm always, book. yeah, I'm always really fascinated by these feminists of that time period. Yeah. You know, they must've been so few and far between and to have that strength and that like moral to stand ground and, and yeah. And to be that vigorous to travel all that way by yourself, which would have just been, I couldn't do it now. Yeah, but when she references her cologne, I wonder yes. if, you know, when you think of, she's a woman alone in this canoe with all these sweating men, perhaps that's why she kept it so <laughs> close as well. Who knows? But yeah, the women like that, they just fascinate me. Yeah. I admire them. Yeah, and, and they do give you a great description of, of the time because I don't know if you have a lot of diaries in your collection, but it's interesting to see. We have a few um, of, of men in the past and they're not very descriptive and, uh, and they're, more, they're more concerned with the weather <laughs> of the day yes. than anything else. So if you want to know what the weather was like, yeah. 
1909 on February 12th, we might be able to find out, but uh, you know, to know what's going on, um, sometimes that's, that's missing. And so as a writer, she was also a writer, so that's probably why she was very descriptive as well. Um, it was interesting to hear her account um, of this area and, and talking about where the community pensioners were and where they lived and, and talking about the horrors because they were um, really like the war you know, war heroes of the past, and they had fought in European war and then sent here and be given these these homes. And, and she saw them firsthand. I'm like, these are not nice homes they're mm -hmm. given. And these are, our, you know, our, our war heroes in a way. So it's going to be compensating them. Yeah. Poor yeah, compensation. Exactly. Yeah. And some of them were disabled, I believe, like missing hands. And, yeah, yeah. and I can't imagine trying to farm or, yeah, rough it up here. Yeah. With that added burden, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. 18, 1838 or 1836 would have been quite rough here. So, yeah. all right, Jan. So, <laughs> what is our topic for next week? Because I don't oh, know. Oh, no, you've oh, caught me off guard. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be. Well, we've had a dumping of snow this week, so it's going to be something to do with snow. Okay. <laughs> all right good one so i guess hopefully maybe some of the snow will be gone by next week when we yeah. do our next yeah. show and tell but all right so next week we'll be back again with something snow related so i hope you join us again bye bye, bye. bye.